Hello, everybody, and welcome to another beautiful Thursday morning. You're listening to Bhavani on IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today. I have a great show lined up. My guest is going to be Marianne Hennen. She is the documentary filmmaker who brought us the film Vanishing of the Bees, and she has a lot to share with us going on right now. So I'm really excited to have her on, and I'll tell you more about her in just a little bit. But first, I want to share with you some things going on in and around the news and, of course, my weekly recipe with you. First off... um, For those that celebrate the Jewish New Year, I want to wish everybody a happy and healthy holiday. Um, We had 30-plus people here last night celebrating the New Year, and it was wonderful. Um, One of the traditions every year during the holiday of Yom Kippur is bringing pantry items to your local synagogue or food pantry. This year, actually we started it last year, bringing shelf-stable items, we started a Give Healthy campaign, which is where you can virtually pledge a a dollar amount to give organic vegetables to our local food pantry. And we were um, giving it to, not Island Harvest, to the Long Island um, Harry Chapin Foundation. And it's a wonderful food bank that serves many of the food pantries on Long Island. And you can just um, go right online. I have a link from my website and donate actual dollars and pick what you'd like to have them deliver to the food pantry, whether it's onions, broccoli, carrots, whatever. So um, it's a wonderful way of giving and it's a, you know, an annual tradition. I guess the thought is, you know, for the day of food, the day that you don't eat food when you're fasting on Yom Kippur, that you take that food and you give it to those that are in need. But something I have been doing for the past 24 years, this will be my 25th year, is an annual Thanksgiving feast for the, we say the homeless, but it's really the less fortunate because many of them do have homes, but they are needy enough that they are willing to wait online for hours to get food and clothing and This will be our 25th year feeding the residents around Rufus King Park who are in need. And I partner with the River Fund Food Pantry, which is a nonprofit um, food bank. And it's really an awesome event. You know, last year I think I had about 130 volunteers come through the IE Green Homestead helping to cook and prepare a Thanksgiving feast for those in need. And we made enough food for about 1,000 people. So that's coming up again. I have a sign-up on my website if you want to sign up to volunteer. I have to limit how many people can come at different shifts because my house is not so big. But um, we make use of the whole house, and it's really a fun event. So if you would like to participate, you can sign up on my website. Um, Some other things going on in and around that you may want to participate in. Um, Climate Wednesdays at the Brooklyn Library. Uh, next week on October 16th is the next one. Um, they're doing these Climate Wednesdays once a month. So October 16th is Climate Wednesday, um, looking at alternative methods of um, heating your home and It's called Climate Smart Energy, Heating, Cooling, and Turning on the Lights. Um, That's October 16th, and then they have another one on November 20th, which is Parenting in the Age of Climate Change. And then the last one is December 11th. Actually, I'm not sure if it's the last one, but the last one I'm aware of right now. December 11th is the Green New Meal, and I will actually be moderating that panel discussion. They have great three great panelists, um, Elizabeth Henderson from NOFA, New York. She will be talking about policy. Um, And then Onika Abraham from Farm School NYC, she'll be there. And then Nancy Romer, who was the founder of the Brooklyn Food Coalition, she'll be talking to us also about um, climate change and food. So those are three great Wednesdays at the Brooklyn Public Library, the main branch um, down by Grand Army Plaza. Um, Bon Appetit is having their 
big holiday party at in, in this Industry City in Brooklyn on October 19th. Um, Food Tank NYC, New York City Summit and Gala Dinners coming back to New York November 1st and 2nd at NYU. Uh, Food Tank is a great, great nonprofit organization that I subscribe to. It's wonderful. They're filled with so much information. So if you don't know about Food Tank, uh, check them out online. They're really wonderful. Um, November 1st through 3rd is a wonderful retreat happening with Maria Michael, who was a guest on my show last month. Um, she is a Lakota shaman um, healer, and she has a lot of great insights, and um, just being in her presence is really special. And she is doing a retreat um, called Remembering Who You Are and Maximizing Your Potential. So that's at Our Lady of Grace Retreat Center in Hassett, New York. Really worth checking out. The Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group is having their um, seventh or having their annual conference. It takes a region, and that this time will be taking place in New Jersey City. Um, and that's from November 7th through 9th. November 8th through 13th is the 7th National Farm-Based Education Conference going on in Baltimore, which is another great event. Um, definitely worth checking out. Oh, there's so many different things. What else do I want to share? The um, November 14th, there's a big protest going on in Washington, D.C. at the National Mall um, to speak out against mandatory vaccinations. Um, this is something that's in the news. I know the media and PR is really doing a great job at getting the message across that everyone needs to vaccinate themselves or they're being selfish and not looking at um, the safety of the greater good. However, there's a lot of different opinions on that. I have a different opinion than that. Um, I think everyone has needs to have freedom of choice. I don't think every vaccine is worthwhile. I think the billions of dollars that pharmaceutical companies are making off of vaccines is really a scam. And the ones that are testing the vaccination safety are the vaccine companies themselves. Our Food and Drug Administration has no money for those kind of tests. So they just trust what the <coughs> pharmaceutical companies say. And there's no way they can actually test all the different combinations of vaccinations. So I have a lot of opinion in that, and I know we'll be talking about that again in a little bit with my guest, Mary Ann, in a little bit. So um, stay tuned for that. And uh, check out all the upcoming events that are going on. Uh, if you, again, if you want to sign up for the Thanksgiving feast for the less fortunate, you can do that at the IE Green Homestead. I mean, uh, the IE Green website. I want to share with you my recipe for this week. It's going to take a little bit of time because it's not a weekday recipe. This is definitely a weekend recipe. There's many different steps to it. Um, while I was creating the recipe, you know, it, it took hours. Um, now that it's created, it won't take that long for you to make it at home. But know that it is a um, a more intensive recipe than my usual weekday recipes. But I have a I had a craving for chili rellenos. And chili rellenos is, you know, a, a fried chili pepper, or poblano pepper that's really filled with cheese. And so it's something I don't usually order, not only because it's fried, but because it's just filled with cheese and not so great. So I thought, decided to make it vegan. And um, I did still fry it, but um, I also then baked it in the oven. So it really came out delicious, and I want to share that with you. So I made, there's a, four parts to it. There's the filling, there's the batter, there's a cashew lime cream that I put on top that, you know, I garnished it with and I also made some to act as a sour cream substitute, and then I made a sauce. So um, for the filling, you need an onion, a serrano pepper, which is optional because it actually did make that spicy. So if you don't like spice, leave the serrano pepper out. One Japanese eggplant that I diced, it totaled about two cups diced, one yellow summer squash, also two cups diced, one green pepper, and when that was diced, it was only one cup, two cups of cherry tomatoes cut in half, two tablespoons chopped garlic, one and a quarter teaspoon salt, a half a teaspoon of chipotle pe powder. Um, if you don't like spicy, 
or smoked flavor. You can just use regular chili powder for that. One teaspoon cumin, one teaspoon of regular chili powder, two cups of cooked brown rice, one can of black beans, and two tablespoons of chopped cilantro. Then for the batter, I used a half a cup of masa harina, which is basically a corn flour with some lime in it. Um, You know, it's something traditional for making tacos or tortillas. Um, I use that. And then I use also a cup of, or half a cup of bisan flour, which is also known as garbanzo bean flour or chickpea flour. One teaspoon of baking powder, one tablespoon potato starch, juice from one can of chickpeas, a half a teaspoon of salt, and three-quarters cup of water plus one tablespoon of water. And then for the cashew lime cream, I used two cups of cashews that I had soaked for two to three hours and drained, one cup of water, juice of one lime, and a half a teaspoon salt. And then for the sauce, I used one onion diced, one serrano pepper, one small purple sweet pepper, That's because that's what I had in my garden, but you can use whatever pepper you have. Four cups of cherry tomatoes, halved. Two tablespoons garlic, a quarter teaspoon salt, and one teaspoon of dried oregano. So starting with the filling, I sauteed the onion and olive oil until translucent. I added the garlic and peppers and cooked that for a few minutes. While that was cooking, I steamed the eggplant for 10 minutes. Eggplant is one of those vegetables that really needs to be cooked well till it's really soft to be good. But if you try cooking it in oil, it absorbs so much oil. So steaming it is really a great way to go, or you can roast it in the oven. But I steamed it, and then I added it to the um, pan with the rest of the vegetables. I added the summer squash and the spices and the salt to the onions and cooked that for about five more minutes. I added the steamed eggplant into that, along with the black beans and the cherry tomatoes, and continued cooking until the tomatoes got soft and were broken down a bit. Then I added the brown rice, the cilantro, and kept cooking for a couple more minutes until all those flavors came together. While that was cooking, I blended the ingredients for the cream in my food processor. So I added the cashews um, and the water to the food processor and blended that up. Um, For the batter, In an electric mixer, I beat up the juice from the can of chickpeas. That's also known as fava juice or fava whites. Um, And believe it or not, it it really beats up to be like egg whites. And that will keep the batter light and airy for um, putting on top of the peppers. Um, In a separate bowl, I combined the dry ingredients. I added the water and mixed it well until there were no lumps with it. You know, I used... uh, a whisk and really mixed up the flowers with the water until there were no lumps. Then I folded in the fava whites or the chickpea whites until that was well blended. Um, Then I wanted to stuff the peppers, but what I first had to do, um, I needed to broil the peppers under the broiler so that the skin got nice and smoky. Um, or, you know, the skin got charred. And then I put it into a bowl and covered the bowl with some saran wrap and let that sit for about 15 minutes until the skins kind of steam off of the rest of the pepper. And then you can can take it out of the bowl and the skins just peel right off of the peppers really easily. And then you want to stuff the peppers. So you make a small slit down the side of the pepper and you take out the stem and remove the seeds and then you fill the peppers with the filling. Um, Once it's filled... The filling doesn't fall out. You kind of just fold the pepper back together and then dip it into the batter and fry that up. Um, And I fried it in a little bit of olive oil um, until it was golden brown, and then I removed them. To make the sauce, I sautéed the onions in another cast iron frying pan. I added the garlic and the serrano pepper and the purple pepper and cooked that for about five minutes. Then I added the cherry tomatoes and cooked that for five more minutes. And then using a mini Cuisinart or an immersion blender, you want to puree the tomato mixture so that it gets smooth. And continue cooking, and the sauce becomes a deeper red color. And at the very end, I added the teaspoon of oregano. And then um, I 
you know, if you're going to serve it right away, you can put the, the hot sauce right on top of the fried poblano peppers. Um, if you're going to save it for later, you can, you know, drain the peppers on a paper towel to absorb any of the oil, put it into a Pyrex baking dish, and heat it up in the oven when you're ready to serve it. And I'd heat the sauce separately and then garnish it with the sauce. And then the cashew cream, the recipe makes it a thick cream, so it's kind of like sour cream consistency. But I wanted to also have some that was a little thinner so I could um, squeeze it out onto the pepper and decorate the pepper. So I added a little bit of water to a little bit of the cream so that I could do that. And um, I put it into a little squeeze bottle and garnished the peppers with that. You can see the pictures on my re- on my website at ieatgreen.com. It was, like I said, you know, a many-part recipe, but it really was worth it. God, when I sat down to eat that, it was just excellent. So I hope you make it. Um, if you do, I love feedback, so please give me a call or um, send me an email. Let me know how you liked it. Make any suggestions or what you did to adjust it for yourself. I always love hearing from all of you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Marianne Henain. She is the documentary filmmaker who brought us Vanishing of the Bees, um, which was narrated by Ellen Page. Um, she's a Canadian-born investigative journalist. She's also an activist, a functional medicine consultant, and an entrepreneur, in addition to her filmmaking. And she just recently wrote an article in the Epic Times that was an expose of the censorship that is taking place across different social media platforms. And she's specifically looking at Google, um, but I think this exists across other platforms as well. And um, this, this censorship really is taking place around alternative health modalities and who knows what else, but anything that's going against the mainstream way of thought. Um, we may not be having access to as much as we think, you know, we can Google search just about anything. They're really deciding which things are being pulled up and which things aren't. So that's going to be really a, a great discussion. So I'm thrilled to introduce all of you to Marianne. Marianne, are you with me? I am with you. My name is Miriam with an M at the end. Miriam. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So, um, can you start by just giving us a little about your history? Like, how did you get into health and wellness? Yes. First off, thank you for having me on your program. I'm very grateful at the opportunity to get um, my message out there because I have been shadow banned and deranked. So I believe that my path started when I was 29. I had just come to America from Montreal, Canada, and I was hit by a Ford Explorer and dragged 50 feet across the cement and broke several bones, including um, my left femur, which had to be outfitted with a 14-inch titanium rod. And so I quickly realized what Western medicine is like, having come from Canada, where I guess I took health for granted. And it was really an initiation. I fought to remove the hardware from my body, which most humans don't do. And after that, because of PTSD, my body kind of exploded. And every situation that came up, whether it was an ovarian cyst or realizing, you know, quite early on in 2005 that I was allergic to gluten and sugar, um, I started taking a deep dive into alternative, alternative health and really became my own best health advocate. Uh, Fast forward, the bees flew into my life in around the end of 2006, and I spent five years um, making, directing, producing, writing, Vanishing of the Bees, along with George Langworthy. And that further opened my eyes to our poison food supply. And, um, you know, what, what are we without food? Uh, So, made the movie, and then after making the film, uh, created Honey Colony, which is a health, it's a magazine and marketplace online, and and, um, 
Thank you. And and that really took a lot of time to create. We had a lot of, we still have a lot of very well researched stories, and um, eventually, we're we're here now, where we live in an age of techno fascism. So we started noticing that our traffic was dwindling. We, I do focus in, on my story in the Epoch Times on Google, but certainly I have a whole book of uh, whether it's uh, Facebook or Twitter or giving interviews that have been taken down, uh, just feeling suppressed and then realizing that others in the health and wellness field that are better known than I, such as Dr. Mercola or Green Med Info, have also come to the same fate of censorship. Maryam, um, I'm going to stop you for a minute. Yeah. I want to backtrack a little yeah. bit. Um, before we get into your latest article, I want to go back a little bit uh, on the film um, and ask you, did you, you know, what inspired you to do a documentary on bees and did you use the bee venom at all in your healing process? So after my near-death experience, I was looking for something that was bigger than me. I had been a freelance journalist up until then, working on also as a producer for different production companies. I, I guess as a Canadian, con- conservatively raised, um, kind of was a wire and was writing not only co- covering Hollywood, but also covering writing articles for Penthouse. And then just really wanted to do something that was, like I said, bigger than me. And the, George um, had shared that the bees were disappearing and that this was a global issue and he thought it would be a good documentary we had been looking to to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Right before that, I worked with Robert Greenwald and the Sierra Club and produced uh, a piece on the Exxon Valdez oil spill. There was another section on uh, the workers at 9-11 Uh, So I spent an afternoon looking at the bees and I was really enchanted by the fact that they're a sacred society. They're uh, females uh, predominantly working for the greater good and then literally started having bee visitations. So that's how the bees came in. And yes, during during the the filming of, of Vanishing of the Bees, I have an still use bee venom. If a bee does sting me, she dies. It's not in her best interest. Uh, But I believe, you know, I've heard amazing stories of people healing from Lyme and the bee venom, everything that the bee creates is truly magical and medicinal. And I am in service to the bees and all they represent. And Mm -hmm. and my message, I guess, after 10 years, um, because... I believe a year and a half ago was 10 years since colony collapse disorder was first discovered, and it was also the 50th anniversary of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. The irony is that she was fighting or speaking out against DDT. These systemic pesticides used in our food supply are 5,000 to 10,000 times more dangerous than DDT. Also, their metabolites stay in the soil, and they become, it takes about 18 years for them to break down, and oftentimes the metabolites are more dangerous than the parent compounds. So these systemic pesticides are uh, neonicotinoids. They are Mm nicotine-based. There are many different types. Uh, They have been banned in Europe, and there was a kind of bounce back, and it's also ironic that the honeybees are doing better in the cities than they are in the countryside because of the poison. I mean, we have organophosphates, which is the remnants of World War II, which are sprayed on top of things, and certainly, you know, all of that lends to it. During research, it was found that one um, systemic pesticide, when it comes in, in contact with a fungicide or an herbicide, can become a thousand times more lethal. So they synergize. 
and mm-hmm. there are 85,000 chemicals that are, have been put out into the environment that are not regulated and that we are also impacted by. Yeah, you know, really when I know that- during the intro, you know, just talking about vaccinations, which I know we'll probably get into again later, you know, there's no way to test for all the combinations. And just like you're talking about how, you know, when they combine together, they become more lethal. Um, you know, the same way, you know, I've used the example of mixing bleach and ammonia, you know, together becomes lethal to, you know, your cleaning lady, you know, and you need to educate yeah. them not to mix those two things. Each one alone, you know, is toxic, but com- combined together, it can kill you. So we just, there's just no way that all these things are being tested, and yet people just don't even think twice about just giving it to their children. And, you know, I think kids are up to like 60 shots by the time they're five years old, something ridiculous like that. So it's really... Well, actually, I'll let you, I'll be more specific. Give me a second. Uh, Back in the day when I was growing up, there were 23 doses of seven vaccines. Now there's 69 doses of 16 vaccines. 50 of them are given before the age of six. Right, right. And and the schedule is, is going to change and the schedule is going to get more grave. So. And it's going to start mandating that adults who didn't have their vaccines go back and get them. I mean, it's it's a scary thing. So, um, but I, I don't want to sidetrack you into that right now. But yeah. I, it is okay. definitely definitely disturbing, and it's not the message that the public wants. You know that the PR and social media is trying to get us to um, to spew out and to share. You know, I had an interesting conversation last night with my niece who was so sure that, you know, getting vaccinated was the, you know, the better choice for the good of the, the public. Well, that's, that, that is a very, a very uh, supported perspective now. It's right. A very it's the thing that they topic. want us to take away. It's the takeaway that they want us to have. And they're doing a good job in their PR because that's what people are thinking. And, you know, and people aren't thinking outside of the box and thinking, independently and so um, I know that's what we want to talk about in just a little bit but before we get there how did you start Honey Colony and can you tell us about your site? Yeah so Honey Colony is a magazine and it's a marketplace and after it kind of the the concept came to um, my business partner and I while we were in the Dominican Republic I was there ironically well, I say ironically because I ended up getting sprayed by pesticides like the bees. I was there um, showcasing vanishing of the bees and talking about how the bees pollinate and forage and the similarities between social media and sharing information and the bees. So we kind of created Honey Colony where we were proverbially foraging for the best information and the best products. So initially we were representing other people's products, and then we created uh, many of our own and branded, and we were looking to Google to create these organic search terms and create articles based on what people were actually looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the site... And when was that? How long ago? The site was born in 2012. Uh And there are hundreds and hundreds of articles. Um, Because now I'm a functional medicine consultant, I really, functional medicine is really the future of medicine. We position ourselves to be on the front lines. However, because I started selling CBD oil, really, again, as a visionary back in 2015, at the end of 2015, I started reporting and exploring and fe- and experiencing what I dubbed techno-fascism uh, way before this happened with Google and other platforms like Facebook. So, mm-hmm. yeah, really started feeling the wrath because Big Pharma is also trying to capitalize and corner a market that is estimated to be valued at $22 billion by 2020. Which market are you talking about? I'm talking about cannabinoid, CBD oil. Okay, 
CBD oil, uh huh. Yeah. So that I'm mentioning it because the starting to sell that cost us a lot of problems because the mainstream processors, PayPal, Stripe, Square, QuickBooks, uh, one after the other, shut us down. So if you don't have a merchant processor as an online company, an e-commerce site, you cannot uh, make a transaction. So that that is something common that other entrepreneurs in the CBD world have experienced. And uh, today CBD is very popular, and I say that everyone and their mother is making CBD, including Kim Kardashian and, and Martha Stewart. Mm-hmm. Um, again, going back to some of your history, yes. I just want to get all this in. I know yes. you were diagnosed with lupus. I don't know when that was, but you reversed it. How did you do that? So I was diagnosed with lupus and fibromyalgia after being sprayed by pesticides. Um, I thought they were using a leaf blower when I was in the Dominican Republic, but in fact, it was someone fumigating between two buildings against mosquitoes with a chemical that is probably illegal in the United States. I returned and um, I wasn't even able to go up the stairs without being in complete pain, went to see an endocrinologist and um, later realized that it was chemical body burden and they told me I have lupus and fibro and it took six years for me. I used an arsenal of different natural remedies to reverse my anti-nuclear antibodies, which were off the charts and um, now stand to empower and, and, and help other people reverse their autoimmune because it's just a label. And in reality, someone, most people who have autoimmune have Epstein-Barr virus or they have some type of te- chemical load or their gut is compromised and the health starts in the gut. So again, functional medicine is really personalized. And when you compare it to Western medicine, it's myopic. So I no longer have lupus and arguably never had lupus. What I had was toxic body burden. Um, Some of the various things I used was CBD oil, uh, were coffee enemas to help detox because a lot of times you could do all the right things, but if you're not taking the chemicals out of the body, then it's pretty useless. So, yeah, a myriad myriad of different uh, modalities I used, all natural the doctor wanted to put me on Cymbalta, which is an SSRI, wanted to put me on prednisone, which is a steroid, and I refused both of them. Right, right. So now um, now I would like to get into some of you know your latest article, but before we do that, let's take a couple-minute break, and when we come back, I'd like to talk about um, what you've been finding with, you know, um, visitors to your website and the challenges that you're facing when it comes to social media um, searches. So everyone, don't go anywhere. I'm talking with Maryam Hennen, and we will be right back. <laughs> I'm Gary Knoll, the founder of the Progressive Radio Network. Today we have more than 80 producers bringing forth the most progressive and most liberating information, the kind of information you do not regularly hear on any of the mainstream or alternative media. You can help us now. Up to this point, I have virtually supported the Progressive Radio Network, all of its expenses and payroll, myself. But we would like to expand our reach. We'd like to do far more. We'd like to be able to advertise on Facebook and let others know we exist. We are the number one progressive radio network in the world. In fact, we have programs that are most listened to in all of progressive radio. But we could go a lot further. Our message could reach a lot more people, especially at a time when people are desperate for honest, objective insights on the important topical issues of our day. How can you help? It's simple. Go to prn.fm. Go to our main page. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little button, Support Now. And then whatever you can contribute on a monthly basis. 
will make a big difference. It will help get the message out. It will help inform more people, give them more choices. This is where you'll hear in the independent candidates and the people looking to challenge the corruption in government and the industries. But we need to get our reach out further. So please, whatever you can afford on a monthly basis, and there's some suggestions there, and it'll be automatic. All right, thank you very much for continuing to help us help you and the rest of the world on these important issues. And welcome back. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I'm with my guest today, if you're just joining us, Maryam Henain. She is the founder of Honey Colony. Uh, she is the film director of Vanishing of the Bees. And she is an uh, activist. And we're on right now talking about um, some of the screening and um, and censorship that's going on on social media websites. So, Maryam, can you share with us um, your experience with traffic getting to your website? You said, you know, you used to get a lot more traffic and now it's been cut down. Can you share with us that? Yeah, at the height of our website, we were getting 500,000 unique visitors a month which is huge based on, you know, which is very based on our hard, our hard work. There were certain updates that occurred, and we started seeing the traffic dwindling. We were scratching our heads wondering what we were doing wrong. Then eventually our SEO at editor, uh, SEO manager, which I brought on quite recently, inf- informed us that we were part of, this consequence was part of what was called the medic update. So Google has had lots of updates, and these one uh, specifically uh, targeted your money, your life, people that um, not only in the health field, but but that are basically extending life or or telling you how to live your life better and then uh, earning an income from that. So... Yeah, then then found out that that we had lost about now 76% of our traffic. Uh, Fast forward recently, I was at the biohacking conference and Dr. Mercola was there who supported my film, who consider a colleague and I'm I'm friendly with Aaron Elizabeth, his partner. And um, he was not only talking about 5G, he was encouraging people to boycott Google, um, which maybe someone like Mercola can do, but others are maybe more hesitant because Google has become so pervasive if you're talking about Chrome, if you're talking about YouTube, if you're talking about Gmail, Gmail Calendar, Google Docs. Um, and now Google is, is a pharmaceutical company. So, what do you mean they're a pharmaceutical company? Well, first I'll say that because of the algorithmic changes, if you're looking for a story, for instance, on mitochondrial dysfunction and you don't put honeycolony.com or selfhack.com, we will not come up. So now when I say that Google is a pharmaceutical company, I started scratching my head and thinking, hmm, is there maybe a connection between Big Pharma and Google? And I found that when um, Google's parent company in 2015 was Alphabet, that they started investing in pharmaceutical companies. So, for instance, they have Verily Life. They have Glasgow Smith Klein has um, invested about 715 million, and this is all in my my article and you can argue you know basically big tech 
or big pharma is using big tech, Google, as a weapon, and they are giving preference to Western medicine, a.k.a. drugs and pills, and burying information that empowers you to, to get healthy with natural remedies. So then I found out that they're, um, they have a venture capital arm, that that is, um, they've invested in Vaxitech. Vaxitech is a company out of Oxford that is developing a one-size-fits-all flu vaccine. So on top of that, on top of Google being arguably a drug company, they have also removed any organic searches. So now they're using auto-suggestions. But because we live in 1984, they don't call it auto-suggestions. They call it predictions. Uh, so auto-suggestions, I minored in psychology. Anyone could look this up. Is arguably a mind control tactic. It is simple, but it is very powerful. So if you were to do a search and write supplements R, you will see a host of negative um, supplements are not approved by the FDA. Supplements are dangerous. Supplements are scanned. Recently, they have peppered in some more positive words to show how corrupt and maniacal and premeditated this is. So I, I did a follow-up story in for Green Med Info where um, I focus on an article that was written applauding Google for cracking down on these dangerous natural remedies. In this case, they were focusing on CBD and stem cell therapy. When I looked at the author, because I often looked who wrote this, this was written by the Dean of Medicine at Stanford. Well, the founders of Google graduated from Stanford. Stanford um, gained, when Google went public, gained millions and millions of dollars, arguably still has stock, although that information is private. So you start seeing a conflict of interest and misinformation, disinformation being spread about natural health in this case, about CBD. Yeah. Um, very, very, very frustrating, and it's, it's, it's angering because people have the right, as someone who is sick, who is told your body is attacking itself, which is a very damaging statement to tell someone that gets into your subconscious, if I can't trust myself, who can I trust? We see now that people are, blindly using Google and not realizing that they are pawns being manipulated. Right. Right. You really think Google's a, you know, um, a neutral search arm. You know, you just don't think that they are censoring or, you know, giving preference to certain sites. And um, it's really scary to think of that. I know last week I talked about the article that was on the front page of many newspapers that the uh, advice we've all been gotten or given over the last bunch of years of eating less red meat is better for our health, not to mention the environmental impacts, um, but that, you know, kind of stating that science had it wrong and that we were get, given misinformation. And my first reaction is like, who paid for that article? You know, and it came out of Dollhouse University, and so I went on their website trying to find out, you know, who wrote the article, and I, mm. I did not find out who funded the research, but there was a whole page on their website about, you know, corporate partnerships and how they can work together with corporations, and, you know, universities get so much money from these corporations, and they don't get a lot of money from a lot of other places, so they, they need those um, partnerships in order to fund their research, and so it's... Uh, you know, in so many of these things, it's a catch-22, and it's not a clear-cut, um, neutral site. There's conflict of interest, you know, in all the information we're getting. Um, it's Absolutely. really it's scary. I mean, you could cite a movie called What the Health, which is vegan propaganda, and is um, not making any distinction between factory farming and uh, meat-grown 
with reverence, where the animals are not tortured, where the, they're not fed antibiotics, um, that was also tons of misinformation. If you're coming from a functional medicine per point of view, one, the most important thing is to eat clean, to not shame another human being, and for the person to eat for their own condition and for their own biome. And so there's some people that need meat, and as long as it's done in proportion, there's really no diet that, unless you're, you're practicing carnivory, which is also beneficial for certain types that are allergic to lectins and have other um, issues, like you, you can see Michaela Peterson and Jordan Peterson who have improved their health by adopting that, and maybe that's just temporary and not sustainable. So the most important thing is to eat clean because our food supply is adulterated. I just want to go back to your question. So Google's parent company is Alphabet in regards to the ph pharmaceutical subsidiaries. So in 2013, Google founded Calico. Calico's mission is to understand the biology that controls lifespan. So they're into expanding um, and, and treating age-related diseases. Then they founded Verily Life Sciences, which was previously Google Life Sciences, and those pharma companies are partnering with others and they're having babies of their own. And then Verily joined forces with uh, the European pharmaceutical giant Glasgow Smith Klein. And then again, as I stated later on, GV, the venture capital arm of Google's parent company, invested in Baxitech, which is what to me was like, oh, now I realize why it's become so polarized to have conversations about vaccine safety and it's not only google it's vimeo uh, sorry yeah it's it's vimeo that has taken down amazon has taken down books that have to do with vaccine safety this is akin to the burning of the library in alexandria when we are removing information and not allowing a human being to come to their own decision let the people decide so big farm google is basically um, a Trojan horse, perfectly crafted Trojan horse for big, you know, Google's a beautifully crafted Trojan horse for big pharma. This is dangerous because people do not realize that, for instance, Wikipedia is working with Google to pump misinformation. These people who write for Google, uh, for Wikipedia, are anonymous. They're not vetted. And here we are, accredited professionals. I'm a real journalist. I'm a real functional medicine consultant. And I am, it's like I don't have the credit to write these articles that are all well-researched. Mercola, Self-Hacked, Green Med Info, they are well-searched articles with, with citations. And that is no longer deemed credible. It's nonsense. And this is just one area because Google is um, meddling in other parts, uh, whether it's the, it's the elections or just manipulating the way people see information. Mm -hmm. where, where I believe in freedom of speech and I believe in our right to be healthy. This is very important information to get out there. I agree. Um, and like I said, it's not something that you think is taking place. You really think it's a neutral search engine. I certainly did. Um, it just Up didn't occur when? to me. Up and yet I know when, when I've searched certain change. things, I have found it harder to find information. And I never really understood why until, until now. Yeah. I, I, uh, people, people need to know. People need to use other search engines, and these companies need to be held accountable. And there is a movement of us that are working to get the truth out, that are truth seekers, that are in the business of being woke, as Zach Voorhees, the Google whistleblower, recently told me. And is there a search engine that you do recommend that is more neutral? You can use, well... I now use a various one. So I use Quant, Q-W-A-N-T. I use DuckDuckGo, although 
Mm, I'm, I'm still, jury's still out for me on DuckDuckGo. There's another one called Ecosia. Um, so I use various ones as a journalist to compare. And ironically, if I'm looking for pop culture crap or doing a search, then I, then I use Google. Um, mm-hmm. So... Well, I've never even heard of Quant or DuckDuckGo. Say again? I said I'd never even heard of Quant or DuckDuckGo. Oh, yes. Yes. They, they, there's also Bing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what about, like, um, the ones that, like, Firefox or Safari? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting for people to use smaller ones. I haven't really honestly vetted, um, I've never used Firefox or, uh huh, or, yeah. Uh, but, but if you're doing a search, you, you have to kind of do, it, it depends. You have to do various ones. I know that we come up, Honey Colony comes up under DuckDuckGo. Uh huh. And, um, again, I, going back a little bit, I know you said you're a functional medicine um, consultant. Can you share with my yeah. audience what is functional medicine as opposed to alternative medicine, or is it are they one and the same? I, I would say that alternative medicine can fall under functional medicine. Functional medicine is personalized medicine. It's the future. So if you were my client and you came to me, we would do a very thorough intake. We would look at things including antecedents, which are conditions while you were born, your, you know, were your parents smoking? Did they have hypertension? Um, what was going on? Were you vaginally born? Were you breastfed? Did you grow up taking antibiotics? We're really looking at the whole picture so that we can address the root and not just give you a Band-Aid like Western medicine does or a drug that only causes other side effects. So we're really treating treating the root, and we're looking at you as a human, as a, it's personalized. Uh, so we would look at your gut, we, we would look at a myriad things to give you a diagnosis or a treatment plan. And yes, I really, I strongly believe it, it's, it's the future. You realize how nuanced medicine is and the cofactors that go along in, in, in producing, let's say, ATP, which is energy. You look at the mitochondria. Does Western medicine look at any of this? No. In four years of education, they get less than 25 hours of uh, education when it comes to nutrition. What happened to Hippocrates and food is by medicine? What happened to do no harm? What happened? Right. I mean, at what right. point, at one point do, does someone have the courage to say, we are slowly being poisoned and there's a depopulation agenda? I have no problem saying that anymore. I will be the first one on the dance floor to have that conversation. Um, when you realize that they're putting yoga mat ingredients in bread, when they've taken, let's say, um, they've taken iodine out of bread and, and replaced it with bromide, when you realize, and if you look at any of the ingredients and you see the crap and the amount of sugar that is in there, you wonder, do they have our best interest in mind? Or are they slowly poisoning us? Why, is, why are we living in 2019 where one in every two people has a chronic illness today despite all the prescription drugs, despite the fact that this is one of the richest countries in the world? No, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, our, our health care system is broken. It's not really about health care. It's about, um, you know, pharma. Insurance companies making money, pharmaceutical companies making money, hospitals and doctors making money. It is not about keeping us healthy. I mean, I've been saying that for ages. I agree with you. Yes. Um, before we run yes. out of time, I know you say you, that you've been selling CBD oil and you're one of the earliest yes. people that have been doing that. Um, but in the news, there's been lots of questions about how CBD oil is made, that all CBD oil is not created equal. And, you know, just yeah. like we're I'm talking about we our food system, I'm sure, you know, pharmaceutical companies are involved in making CBD oil and using butane versus other methods. Can you talk to us just briefly, because like I said, we're almost out of time, 
about the different CBD oils and what someone should be looking for when buying it. Absolutely. One, yes, Big Pharma has created their first ever FDA-approved CBD. They are spreading misinformation. The FDA had a hearing on May 31st, and the takeaway was that the hype has outdone the science. That is absolutely not true. There are absolutely certain standards one must look for because there's something called hepatic first pass. So if you're taking an oil in an oil, an isolate versus full spectrum, you're not enjoying the entourage effect. Secondly, because of hepatic first pass, it will degrade by the time it gets to the liver 80 to 90 percent. So I'm sorry, you've got to backtrack again. What, yeah. is her, what are you saying, hepatic first pass? What is hepatic, that? Hepatic first pass which basically means that it's being broken down in the liver. So if you're taking it liposomally under the tongue, it goes directly into the bloodstream and bypasses the liver. If you're taking it rectally, it will go again directly into the bloodstream and bypass the liver. You want to also make sure that you're taking a full spectrum because nature synergizes. There's tons of different cannabinoids. Big Pharma likes to synthesize and create a synthetic one-off so it's not it's not enjoying the entourage effect and then certainly there are tons and tons of products out there that are dietary supplements that don't make the cut because they're not organic another thing just to quickly say is that uh, cannabis is a bioaccumulator so they literally used it in chernobyl to clean the soil cannabis is a beautiful amazing plant and we have a cannabinoid system. So the cannabinoids are interfacing with our system and serving as an adaptogen. Oh, so my God, we are out of time. I'm so sorry, okay. Miriam. Can you um, okay, share you. your website with everyone so they know where to go to get more of this information? Yeah, I would ask people to follow me on Twitter, given okay. uh, my compromise reach. So that's Miriam Hinane, M-A-R-Y-A-M-H-E-N-E-I-N. And to buzz on over to honeycolony.com. Wonderful. And I'll share that on my website as well so everyone will have that. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us. You've been listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I'll see you all again next week. Bye for now.